Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 quarter two webinar here at Kloss Financial. My name is Joshua Sterling, and I'm one of the portfolio managers here at Kloss. Uh, today, our webinar uh, expected to run about 25 minutes for the content. At the end of the uh, webinar today, we'll have a, an entire section for Q&A. Um, for those who are new, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, throughout the uh, entirety of the webinar. Today, we are going to shift up uh, our typical format that we have. Today, uh, I will be your moderator. And uh, I'm going to help guide uh, our speakers today through the content that we have, and I'm going to help assist the Q&A at the end. Um, today, I'm joined by two specialists here at our firm. We always like to make sure that we have kind of two different minds from two different sides of our business. So today, I'm joined by our investment professional, Todd Eklund. He is the director of our portfolio management here at Kloss. And we have Eric Schwartz. He is one of our lead financial planners here in the Madison office. A lot of you may uh, know each of them. So as a bit of housekeeping, um, for those who might not know who we are, or as a reminder, uh, as kind of where we came from, here at Cross Financial, we've been in business for about 46 years. Um, we help clients all across the United States. Uh, and we are located in two different offices, though, for kind of our physical locations. We have an office here in our Madison office, where all three of us are from, and then we have our Rockford location down in Illinois. Now, today, the content that we're going to go through, while it's focused on the markets and uh, kind of investments, we always like to remind everybody that the core of our business is financial planning. It is our primary focus because we believe it's the main driver for uh, how we can assist and help clients. But for the majority of our content today, we're going to talk about economics, what's happening in the market, and how that impacts you. So just to let everybody know, you know, we let CJ know that we wouldn't burn down the house without him. We know the markets look like they're a little bit on fire, but uh, we think this thing's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Josh, without further ado, you want to get us, get us going? Absolutely. So, Todd, to kick things off, uh, can you let us know what's been happening in the world and in the market? Boy, you know, since the last time we talked to all you folks at the start of this year in January, a lot has happened. It really has been a pretty remarkable start to the year. Uh, you know, in February, we had conflict overseas in Ukraine. I'd say, at least in my view, perhaps not totally out of left field, but I, I think, perhaps, uh, you know, it wasn't expected to escalate as quickly as it did. And it's, it's been a, a, obviously a major roiling conflict with, with global implications in the markets. We're going to talk more about the, the effects on commodities and oil. We also have a change in Federal Reserve policy and interest rates uh, for the first time in really a decade where they're getting serious about shifting interest rate policy into meaningfully higher gear. And that's got a lot of implications to it as well. Yeah, I think that's what's been so interesting and um, probably unsettling for a lot of clients uh, as we look at the first four or five months of the year is not only have we seen the equity markets pull back um, in response to what's going on overseas and some other factors, but We've also seen the fixed income markets pull back a bit, which is not something we're used to seeing um, and definitely, I think, is, is giving people some, some concern as they're opening their statements. Certainly, we're going to touch on that more in a bit, but uh, I think the magnitude of it is really um, the, the distinction this year. That it's, it's happened really fast and yeah. with um, greater, you know, greater hit to bonds, which are typically considered safe and stable. So we'll talk about that more yeah. later, but it's definitely unique times. So this is supposed to be coming out of COVID and totally healthy, right? I mean, I, I don't know about the, the rest of you, but it feels as if the world broadly is, is healthy and recovered from the depths of the pandemic, right? And yet we have this overhang. It doesn't feel like we're totally out from, uh, you know, the, the malaise of things uh, in terms of getting the world back to normal. So we'll see if this lasts, but the, the inflation that we're having today, and we're going to talk more on that here in the, in the coming slides, is really pretty remarkable. We haven't seen this in almost 20 years. Uh, the, the, the real question today is, is this going to be short term and transitory, or is this something that uh, is longer term or going to require severe corrective action um, to clean up? But there's there's a number of different theories for why this is happening. It's maybe the, the perfect storm of things yeah. at once, would you say, Eric? I, yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think I think what a lot of people are are looking at is, you know, we've 
we have a lot of we have a lot of different things coming together right now and it's it's sort of it's culminated here in the last week or so with getting our first report of negative gdp for since for the first time since 2020 and i think that feels weird to a lot of people because there are a lot of um uh, facets of the economy that feel really strong um, you know, we had some some bright spots in that report. Consumer spending, business spending is all up when measure or when we adjust for inflation, it is it's still um, higher than expected. And we've obviously have some some other factors that we'll talk about here more. But it's I, I would argue it's probably not altogether unsurprising that we're we're seeing this. Well, I would I would uh, throw this back at you. Does it does it feel like the economy is in really bad shape? I mean, maybe we're just looking at the world through rose colored glasses here, but. No, I, I think we'll we'll talk here in a moment about unemployment rate and um, you know some other some other factors, but it doesn't really feel like like it's as as much of a doomsday situation as as it seems like you see on the news. Sure, and just for, to to refresh everyone's memory, uh, a recession. The official definition of a of the a recession in the economy is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So we're not there yet, but you had the first shoe drop in a sense. And we'll see what happens next. Yeah, I think it's it's important to you know that, that's a really scary word for people, right? Recession. It's it's a definition. It's it's two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. I, I don't think that um, as we as we look forward, you know, if, if something like that does happen, it's it's reason for immediate panic or anything like that. It, certainly, I would just say this: the economy, all all the looking backwards <laughs> indicators appear that things are pretty strong. Now, again, I, this unemployment rate that we're looking at right here. Which is is back to normal, healthy, you know, times. And this is a backward-looking indicator, but there's certainly nothing to suggest that we are in a deterioration quite yet. Um, right. And you can't. It's hard to say that to see that necessarily changing. If you recall during COVID, as you can see from the spike, you had a lot of job losses due to whole industries completely freezing, and you know, temporary jobs, you know, at restaurants and you know, uh, foot traffic type type industries. It, it's hard to see something of that severity happening in this world that we're in today. Yeah, I think, you know, I th we, we all go out and about, we all see the help wanted signs in, in every in every window um, of businesses. And it, it's crazy to think with, after all of that um, immediate job loss in the early days of COVID, I mean, by, by um, all measurements, we've replaced nearly all of those jobs um, as of as of last month. So, you know, as, as we continue to move forward, I, I don't see, you know, short of uh, some extenuating circumstances, reasons for us to expect this to change significantly. Perhaps extenuating circumstances, a severe escalation overseas, exactly. something to that effect? Potentially. I'd yes. have to agree. Yeah. So, Eric, thanks so far for uh, kind of all these points. I, I think we've talked a little bit about inflation, just touching on it just a bit. But I'm sure we have clients bring this up all the time in meetings. Uh, what have you focused on for the highlights of that? What have you been focusing on discussions about inflation? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it's probably the first topic we cover in, in just about every meeting. Um, you know, groceries, gas, housing, all of the essentials, there's no question they're, they're costing more these days. And, um, you know, I, I think as we're, as we're beginning to address that, we're really trying to focus on the things we can control. We can't control, you know, how much things cost for the most part, but we can control um, the the way we approach it. So um, this is impacting everybody differently. For for a retiree who's on a fixed income, you know, this is a time where maybe we have to revisit that and say, you know, we're we're distributing a certain amount each month from your IRA for income. Maybe that has to be increased for for a stretch of time. Um, but we're really focusing on on what we're able to control here, and um, that's why we we really focus on the planning side of things and making sure that people are in um, are in a position to be able to to uh, manage things like this as they come along. Well, if we if we jump ahead here a moment, where are we feeling it the most? Uh, you know, we, you can maybe speak anecdotally, but we're going <laughs> to look at prices at the pump. Boy, I don't know about you, but my my, my SUV gas bills just went up a lot. Yeah, this is this is one that we all see every day, right? I mean, we all, for the most part, have to drive places. You have to put gas in your tank to go to work, and um, you know we've seen this huge spike since the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And um, you know, in recent weeks, we had seen a little bit of relief um, on the uh, 
on the oil price side of things, but it seems uh, in the last few days I've noticed as the European Union looks at potentially uh, banning Russian oil, we've seen um, prices jump right back up again. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where we'll we'll see how long it lasts, but it's it's certainly impacting our clients. So, who should be more worried: the mother of five kids that drives a Chevy Suburban, or a retiree, you know, approach from uh, you know two years out from retirement with these sudden spikes in what what we spend our money on as consumers? Well, I think that might be a dangerous question to answer. <laughs> um, depends who you ask, but I, I think this really is affecting everybody in different ways. Like I, I you know I said that earlier, but. Um, our, the best thing we can do is look at this from the perspective of, okay, how do we adjust? How do we manage this? Um, and for the most part, as we've, as we've been meeting with clients and, and talking through these things, you know, the, these are certainly impacting the day to day, but we have been able to make adjustments for clients, whether that's, um, you know, for the retiree increasing income temporarily, or, um, you know, looking at ways to, to cut costs, um, as we as we move through this, so we're so, gonna look at a moment. This moment, you know, zoom out a bit, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Todd. I think this is very appropriate for you as uh, as kind of our more economics focused individual, because uh, I know that we all see what's happening here, uh, kind of in our local market. But yeah, what does the picture look like worldwide? Yeah, you, it's always good to just take a broader look say, okay, is it, is it that bad? Well, it depends on who you ask and depends on, on, you know, how much you dig into it, right? So here in the U.S., we've got fairly high gas prices, you know, I'll round up here a bit closer to $5 than we've been in a long time on average. But look at if you're in, you know, one of the European Union countries like Germany, almost double where we are. So they're feeling it much worse over there. But on the other hand, they don't. They aren't as reliant on transportation and driving the cars as much as we are. With a lot of the countries in Europe have uh, public transit, so it really doesn't affect their consumers the same way. Um, now, at, at, at the epicenter of all this in Russia, gas is dirt cheap. But I also don't know if Russians are driving all that much. Mostly, this is true. <laughs> so you know, it, it's it's important to keep that in context. Uh, you know, the U.S. certainly compared to a decade ago is in a, in a more independent place, oil wise, but clearly not. Um, off of oil uh, entirely. Right. I think as we've been able to, um, as the U.S. has been able to supply much of its own oil, um, we're, we're able to better control, but we're certainly not immune from these price hikes at all. It seems like in this environment, it's nice to be able to kind of look at what's been happening and be able to isolate, not a, a specific issue, but see kind of a cause and effect of kind of what happened and, and why uh, it, it's been rising. Hopefully it doesn't last forever, but uh, it certainly hopefully makes it. On, on that note, I mean, I can remember in 2007, 2008, the last time we sort of had an oil spike crisis, you all will recall but before the, the recession got so bad that summer of 2008 was around these prices at the gas pump. And, you know, it, it's funny coming full circle that, uh, you know, I think back then I said, you know, nobody will ever drive a Hummer H2 ever again in this country, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw LeBron James in a commercial this year at the Super Bowl for, for a big Hummer SUV. Now, they might have some um, hybrid ones now, but, you know, to your point, Eric, will it last? Too soon to tell. It is certainly too soon to tell. And, and it'll be interesting to see if we, if we see some of those behavioral changes we saw back, you know, 13, 14 years ago now as people transition to more fuel efficient vehicles and, and things like that. So I know that we've talked a lot about inflation so far, uh, but let's have one more discussion on inflation. So in this environment, uh, both Todd and Eric, uh, what does it mean for uh, individuals and their investments? What, what should they be doing and what should they focus on? As, a, as an anchor point, we just want to explain what we're looking at here. So this is, this is real bond yields, meaning uh, the nominal yield, which is a line in blue, is just what, what is the interest rate on a bond? And then the gray line is what is the interest rate on that bond? You're getting paid after accounting for inflation. So you can see if you if you look towards the right of the chart, we've been low or close to zero for quite some time, and and that was a pretty remarkably low in a historical context. Now we've now gone totally negative. I mean, underwater, uh, unlike ever before. So this has real implications, Eric. For you know, what are some of our things when we talk with people about where they have to take risk, where they get paid? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they look at their savings account or their money market account, and it it feels really good, right? You're looking at you're looking at the same well these days the same balance every day, not a lot of interest. <laughs> Um, and you know they're, they're noticing, well, I'm not losing any money in this. But this is, I guess, how we what we would describe as losing money safely, right? So your bank account may not have gone down in the last year, but as inflation has spiked, um, you've technically lost maybe seven or eight percent on those dollars. And I think this um, this is not necessarily, you know, class financial telling people they need to invest the money in the market rather than than having it in their checking or savings account. But I think it, it bears a discussion of, you know, what, what is the money that you have sitting on the side for? Is it, you know, money that you're gonna be using in the next one to two years, who knows? But it, we really wanna focus on having a purpose for, for all of the dollars you have. And at times like these, it can be really difficult um, when we're looking at those dollars that are maybe longer term dollars and we're seeing um, we're seeing balances down, we're seeing the market pull back. Yeah. Um, it can be difficult to stick to the plan, but there, there's risk in having money in the savings account as well. Yeah, and I think we, we've harkened this point for a long time that you have to take risk somewhere in this environment to yeah. get, get a return. And if you go back 25 years ago, you could actually, there was actually a period of time where you could just sit in a bond and comfortably yeah. get a, a return well above inflation, call it a day. If you didn't want to take a lot of risk, you, know, you wouldn't be underwater. It right. just hasn't been that case, you know, for the past 10, 15 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, I, I think you know that there, that 10 to 15 year timeline, I mean, there, there was a time when you could, could get decent returns on bonds, and that's just not the world we live in today, unfortunately. I, I know when the, uh, uh, when the real yield that we look at today, uh, we always come with the advice of, yeah, stay in the market, uh, stick with your investment, stick with your strategy, but uh, looking at this next slide here, uh, year-to-date returns kind of everywhere uh, make it challenging to stick with that. What What are your thoughts on that? You want me to start? I mean, yeah. boy, it's it's as we said at the outset, it's it's been a strange, fairly you know ugly year to begin things. Now it's important to we're only not even midway through the year just yet, right. but there's really been nowhere to hide, right? Uh, you know, I think what we'd like to to emphasize is. Being diversified and sticking to a you know a balanced portfolio, which most people we work with are generally you know utilizing some some form of, still has its benefits. But you look at the the Nasdaq, for instance, which is a, an index full of high flying tech stocks, down seventeen and a half, probably twenty percent after a day like today. Yeah. Um, you know bonds, which are which are supposed to be your safe place to be, down close to ten, which is not something we've experienced in. in past 10, 20 years ever. Yeah. So it's not, there's been nowhere to go. Um, but what would you, what would you say, Eric? Yeah, I, I guess I would add to that, you know, as, as we've looked at, we can see both, um, both indices here and seeing that, that bond number down 9% um, year to date is, is certainly something I've not seen in my career. And I, I think it's also important to point out, um, you know, the Federal Reserve is, is, has made, um, has made a promise essentially to raise interest rates quite aggressively this year. Um, and I, I think that although it's strange to see a 9% drop in bonds, if we think through it and we think, okay, the Federal Reserve is raising rates quite quickly, it's not altogether surprising that they've gotten hit like this. And hopefully it's it's not something that that we would see long term, rather a, sure. a shock to the so, system. So most of the time, at least, you know, the past call it. 10, 15 years, when you, when you have a spike in interest rates and bonds decline, it's fairly short term and you don't have a protracted loss over an extended period. You go two years back to back, for instance, yeah. uh, or, or a move like this. We'll see what happens, you know, but in, in a scenario in which they continue to aggressively raise interest rates, that number is not going to change and get much better, certainly, yeah. in terms of what your bonds will do for you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, don't own bonds, but it, 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 it means that, you know, we've always used this term light switch, right? You don't want to be in or out of the market. You own exactly. a little bit of both. There's not a, an on off switch, but um, certainly it's hard to imagine bonds getting back to getting you a 5%, 4% return. Absolutely. Years ahead. Yeah. I think one other thing too, um, I'll put my, my financial planner hat on here. Um, 
what we're doing with clients as we're meeting, because as you can imagine, we are, we are talking through these performance numbers with all of our clients as we're meeting with them. And what we're trying to do is, is really help people gain a little bit more perspective. Um, so obviously they're opening their statements right now, they're seeing um, values down, but what we're trying to do is just kind of help people remember what is the reason that we're investing? We're not investing because we want, you know, because we expect the, the value to shoot up overnight and, and stay there. We're investing because we need to get a reasonable rate of return on our retirement assets in order to, you know, essentially have them last through retirement. So as Connor's look, what does that 60-40 number look like over a longer period? You know, call it three years, maybe five, 10, whichever you want to pick. Yeah. So, you know, if we're we're looking at um, you know, down 10 and a half percent year to date, if we go back just three years, um, that that number on an average annual basis is nearly six percent. So we're looking at um, yes, our, our accounts are that or clients are opening statements, seeing account balances down year to date, certainly. Um, but when we when we just expand that out a little bit more, we look back a little bit further, we can still see that many clients are far ahead where they started. They still have a positive rate of return over that time. But when we really shrink it down and look at the short time horizon which sure. is understandable. You open your statement, you see what's happened recently. Um, but we, what we, this really just comes back to, um, and I'm sure clients get sick of us saying this, but just staying committed to the strategy. Yeah, and if, and if we jump ahead here, right? I mean, we do have these round trips in the market, sometimes rather quickly. We're gonna, we're gonna look yeah. at that here in a moment. I know, Josh, if you, do you wanna uh, explain this to, to the folks here? Yeah, so the slide that we're taking a look here at, uh, well, Todd and I, we were looking at some of the uh, figures that we were uh, that we track uh, kind of in the background uh, on a weekly basis, and we saw a couple of numbers there that gave us a bit of deja vu uh, looking back to uh, the 2020. Uh, the green line that we're looking at here is actually the returns that we had kind of during the COVID period. It's the annual return over the entire time period. And if everybody remembers back May in 2020, uh, everybody was wondering, is it going to be a V-style correction uh, for the market? Um, and what's going to happen uh, throughout the rest of the year? Are we going to get back to zero uh, on the year, a 0% return? And surprise, surprise, we had an incredible year that year. But when we say same result here, Josh, mm -hmm. on the screen, I mean, I think exactly. part of what you're illustrating, right, is that here we are on May, what's say the 5th? Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, uh, almost in the exact same place we were during the year we fell in the pandemic, right? Uh, now the path has been slightly different, but we're in the same place that you were feeling opening those statements, you know, uh, during that very uncomfortable year. And look at how that year turned out. Mm -hmm. Right. I would, I would point out that we're in, <laughs> we are in maybe the, um, just post that first few months of COVID where we're seeing the market sure. roaring back. So feeling a, a little bit better at that point in time. Yeah. But your point is we were, we're at the same level we were at that point in time. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's strange because the economy just feels incredibly strong compared to uh, back where we used to be, <laughs> when there was so much unknown. Yeah. I mean, if you echo that judgment, you can remember during COVID in April, May, we were worried, you know, looking on our cruise lines in this country going to go out of business completely. I mean, the, the economic picture was far dire than it is today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's where the stock market was, right? But we certainly... Uh, the world was in a grimmer place, I think, than, than it is today. Now, granted, we've got a lot going on, but suffice to say, it was earlier that the economy still feels like it's in a fairly stable place, particularly next, next to the depths of 2020. Absolutely, yeah. Now, this just harkens back to uh, looking back to 2020 when things just seemed bleak and unknown, uh, but the rest of the year was just uh, an incredible performing year for stocks. This year isn't written in stone yet. Uh, there's a lot left to go. Um, we're not yeah. suggesting that we're going to get 15, 20% returns. I say it's going to go up, but to your point, Josh, yeah, don't, don't write it in stone quite yet, right? right. I think that's well said. Yeah. So Eric, kind of uh, rounding out the conversation, we've hit on a lot of topics today. We've talked about the market downturn, inflation, how the Fed's responding uh, to the high inflation, but how should people be responding to this with their financial plans? What kind of action should they be taking? Yeah, I, I think in many cases, the, the somewhat unsatisfying answer is there, there aren't a lot of things people should be doing right now, making big changes um, or anything like that. I mean, as we've talked about today, we're, we're a planning first organization. 
Um, nothing against what, what Todd and Josh do. Um, it's very important as well. But we, when we're working with clients, we're, we're talking about um, building out a, a plan to provide retirement income. And when we are working with, with folks, I'm sure a lot of our clients could say they, they probably, um, it, gets, it gets a little old to have them come in for meetings, sit down and you know, go through updates, figure out you know, how cash flow is and talk about some of these things that are, maybe aren't quite as interesting but it's the cornerstone of, of your financial plan and it helps, it helps people get through times like this. So we build out plans, we build out, um, we build out expectations that are extremely, extremely conservative. We are not shooting for the moon in terms of investment returns. And we expect that there will be times like this. We'll, there will be times when the market um, uh, does not give us the types of returns we've seen in recent years. And while, while we're able to evaluate those kind of outlier events and, and make sure that our clients are in a good place, regardless of what the market is doing, um, we can also make adjustments along the way as, as things like you know, this happen. There's your, your control levers that have nothing to do with the market. There are, are many of them. Absolutely. And then determine when that, when that time is needed and what lever that might be. 100%, yeah. And I think the most important thing, we, we talk about it so much, but... Um, there are we don't we don't build a financial plan um, a financial plan success on the expectation that the market will give us the returns we we want every year, but we do build it on the expectation that our, our clients stay the course when when times get tough. Yeah, and um, you know I think we just we just have to look back a, a couple of years to March of of twenty twenty and and realize that um, the importance of staying the course because I don't know about you but I was not expecting the market to come roaring back and recover as quickly <laughs> as it did no. at that time. No way. Right, so perfect. Josh, you. do you want to take it away with our questions? Please uh, toss yeah. them out, uh, especially after a day like today. Hopefully you've got some good ones. Uh, you know, some, some Molotov cocktails at bar and <laughs> the, 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 the uh, conflict overseas. I, I see a few popping in here, but uh, yeah, just wanted to say uh, we thank you and, and appreciate all our clients who put their uh, full faith and trust in uh, allowing us to help you build out your financial plans and help succeed in retirement. But uh, yeah, we've already got a couple of good ones coming in here. So uh, we talked a little bit about the negative quarter of GDP, but we didn't really specifically discuss it. So what caused the negative GDP uh, quarter? Yeah, I think um, that's certainly a loaded question. There's a lot of a lot of factors, but much of what we're seeing is it's it's largely a result of um, uh, massive imports into the United States, while while exports have um, have sort of tapered off. So we had we've had tons of supply chain issues that have caused um, inventories here in the country to really run low. Um, and, and companies need to essentially replenish those, those stockpiles so that they can sell goods and services to consumers. And so what we've seen is just this, this backlog of imports into the country that, that are, you know, really would normally be spread out over time. And it's just, you know, it's, it's sort of offsetting the, the spending that we're seeing within the country. You certainly don't see it on the consumer side in places like we did with, you know, uh, sporting events, food. Right. meals, travel, uh, feels like that is completely back to normal. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the interesting thing is, is we, we talk about all of these things that feel really positive in the economy. And, you know, we, we see the unemployment rate in a good spot. We see that consumers and businesses are spending at higher rates than expected, even adjusted for inflation. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, this is an imperfect metric, right? Where this is, this is something that um, is, is going to be impacted by something that we would all say, well, we're kind of sick of not having supply available at the grocery store. We want companies <laughs> to be importing these goods. Well, that on the GDP side, that doesn't look so good when it's all at one time. I think that's well said. I, uh, sometimes we look at uh, numbers that pop out quarterly and we get surprised, but honestly, it's always about the average, the long-term average and kind of the fluctuations that are required from quarter to quarter. Uh, typically, we talk about those when it's month to month. So uh, a GDP quarter number uh, like this is a bit shocking, but uh, we did just have an incredible GDP at the end of the year last year. So next, next loaded question here uh, is the oh. economy, if the economy is so good, why are stocks down? Boy, well, I think... <laughs> 
the stock market is a forward looking mechanism. And so at any given time, it's taking into account rightly or wrongly, and it does move with sentiment quite wildly, right? We saw that Swings today. the pendulum yeah. up and down. Uh, what, what's going on? And so, uh, you know, whereas numbers like unemployment in the economy, that tells you where we are right now, mm -hmm. but it's backwards looking. There's no, there's no forward looking element to, you know, how many people currently have jobs, right? Right. Um, number, that number looks really good. So it, with the market being, uh, in, uh, my take is that it really is digesting this interest rate policy change. Yeah. Um, it was it was funny because when the Federal Reserve made the announcement earlier in the week, the reaction was initially kind of muted. Yeah. We, we were uh, expecting worse, I feel like, uh, yeah. you know, that day. But, you know, you gave it a couple of days to digest and got a little bit of indigestion from it. Um, <laughs> that would be my take. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think it's important to remember a lot of people will say this. The economy and the stock market are not are not the same thing. Um, the stock market is is pricing in um, you know expected future earnings from from companies it's not not necessarily worried about um, what uh, what the unemployment rate is or or something like that I guess sure and Josh what the, you want to take this next question it has to do with inflation yeah. and portfolio design so I'll, I'll read it off here during a time like this where we've had a really high inflation and we're not sure if it's going to be here to stay or not do you consider layering on inflation hedges into a 60, 40 balanced type portfolio, things like tips, commodities, uh, other real assets or inflation hedging assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of these, and I, I think we've talked a bit about like adding in commodities into traditional portfolios a, a couple of quarters ago, like gold is a very, very common one. But a lot of these asset types that, that we look at utilizing or, or fighting against inflation uh, are already built into the portfolio. Uh, our, our view in building out portfolios um, is not so much kind of tactically managing or trying to time the market. So we don't like to utilize like gold, for instance, as kind of putting it in at the right moment in time. Um, so we have different types of assets within our portfolios already that help us fight inflation as well. Uh, the stocks are, are very typically uh, help ride out inflation as they can kind of uh, match along with it or price in uh, according with inflation. Um, and we utilize uh, very low maturity assets as well uh, in the fixed income realm that can uh, assist in repricing and, and moving with it, uh, interest rates as the Fed increases interest rates as well. So a lot of times, some of these assets are, are looked on as being pure inflation hedges like commodities, um, but a, a lot of times they're utilized in more timing aspects. And, and we try to not, uh, not play that game because- so Some of them, like, in my view, have been inconsistent over time. You know, when, whenever inflation gets crazy, you're gonna see a lot of infomercials for gold and silver on TV, right? And it's just always been that way. But when you really go back in time and look at the numbers on gold, it, it, the jury is out on whether gold really is a, an asset that will help you consistently during inflation. It, it has some periods during history, but there's other times when it has not helped. And I think the same, you could say the same about commodities. You know, the textbooks would say they have generally helped. You know, uh, 2008, that, that summer with the big crisis in oil and, and high price come, commodities skyrocketed and then crashed right afterwards. Yep, exactly. And so I think some of these things are, are at times inconsistent. Um, and we've tried to, to build what we're doing to, to really um, deliver with reliability. Right. And that inconsistency almost or often brings about volatility, right? Yeah. So it's like, it, it's this idea that if we introduce this into the portfolio, we want it to be a long-term holding. We don't want to be moving in and out of things, um, you know, based on which way the wind is blowing. And to hold something like that long term just creates a lot, can create a lot more volatility. And that's not generally what we um, want for a retirement income portfolio, for example. Mm -hmm. All right. And taking a look here. And if we'll hold on just for another minute, but uh, um, if anybody has any further questions at all, please feel free to go ahead and add those in. I'll add one other thing. It was kind of part of that question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, something that we are talking with clients about and, and clients are asking us a lot of questions about 
um, our I bonds because as we look at um, you know inflation where it is, they're linked to the the consumer price index and they're offering some pretty attractive returns. Um, and I know we're going to have um, I, I believe we're going to have some more discussion of this here in the future, but. Um, for, for some clients who have some extra cash and they, they want to look at maybe getting a little bit extra yield on it, um, I-bonds are, are an option. You can you know, purchase those directly. And um, like I said, they're paying an attractive interest rate right now. One thing we have been telling clients a lot and people don't realize, um, you do want to make sure that you have a decent time horizon to hold those, um, at least you know, say five years or so. Um, just so you can avoid any sort of interest penalty if you were to, to want to get your principal back at some point. But um, we think for, for people with, with some extra cash on the side, it can be a good solution, especially at this really strange time. Um, there are, you know, there are limits to the amount you can put in there. I think it's $10,000 per person per year. Um, so, you know, as people are kind of working through this time where they can't get any yield on their cash, this is an option. I suppose it depends on, on where you are and how big a portfolio or, and, and what that differential is going to make to your retirement, right? I yeah. Think, um, yeah. You know, being able to put $10,000 in something for somebody's retirement portfolio in total, you know, yeah. it just, it doesn't get you as far as, as you'd like to, right? Absolutely. And I, and I don't think we, we're, we view this as an alternative to like a traditional investment portfolio, but rather like, hey, you have some money in your checking account that's you know, losing money safely, like we were talking right. about earlier, um, and this is money you don't need in the short run, uh, I think it can be an option. What do you think of NFTs and crypto? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not well, good on no, that. It's path. not good on that. <laughs> so I, I guess when we talk about layering in uh, inflation hedges, uh, I mean, there are so many different roads that you can go down. So uh, one other one that I've been seeing all over headlines uh, about like the traditional 60-40 portfolio, what should you be changing to kind of make it effective in an inflationary environment? One very common thing that you'll see in these headlines is al al alternative assets. And Todd, I promise I won't go very far <laughs> down this road. But one of the most common things that you'll hear about with alternative assets, real estate. We did just want to speak to that very briefly, that uh, we do utilize uh, some very minor real estate within our portfolios. They're publicly traded, uh, very, very liquid, and it is kind of a hedge against inflation. Real estate assets are, are widely known for moving with property price increases. Uh, rent uh, is able to uh, be increased with inflation as needed. There, there's a lot of solid aspects to having a little bit of real estate within your investment portfolio. We're seeing that right now. I think it is the best performing of all kind of the sub asset classes yeah. year over year right now. And, and that's it's in there for a reason. So mm -hmm. you want to have things that zig when the others zag and you're seeing that right now. Exactly. So that is, uh, I know, uh, top headlines for a lot of things when looking at the traditional 60, 40 portfolio. So uh, you can be confident that we do review those and do add those in as necessary. Um, we, we don't look to overinvest in any specific asset type, though. All right. Well, that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> well, well we, folks, um, we appreciate you joining us today. We have one more question. Oh, this is actually a. You know, we, we, we can follow fun. up with that, with that one after. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're running up against our time window, but, you know, we'll see. We appreciate your time this afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in a quarter from now. And hopefully by uh, the mid to the latter part of this year, the, the world has, you know, gotten a bit cheerier. Let's hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so. All right. Thanks so much for joining today. All right. Thanks, everyone.